But without giving away any surprises, because there are a lot of surprises and that's the fun of it and some of the comedy of it. But it is about um, <laughs> that you, it starts out with these two people who look as if they're in love and a woman who is just sort of, who I play, who is just, you know, setting something up. Right. She's setting up to tell this man that she wants to be with him forever. When you find out this is actually not her husband, she's married to someone else. And it the whole thing becomes really it, it, this cast of characters that comes in and everybody's like having an affair with somebody else. And there's all these new things that you find in these surprises. And it's it's really like a study on love and marriage and how we function in that way but very like the most ridiculous version of it and very very funny and it's set in 1923 england the english countryside and so we have these apple crush british accents yes boo are you now it's rule you know it's my first line of the show so oh, um <laughs> and then my character sylvia she thinks you know she's on the 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 brink of of life's beginning and the beginning of it uh and in fully in love she she then sinks to uh feeling quite heartbroken and bitter about it and then she kind of finds herself in this process and realizes she's an independent woman who can stand on her own. So it's just this be beautiful evolution for this character of we think we need someone else but what what we really need can be found within and it's set up to make it work for her right because at that time and even now you know it can be hard for a woman who has the impulse to be independent to actually truly be independent in the world oh that's amazing so it kind of fits in with your theme of empowering oh honey yes <laughs> this, this project checked all the boxes for me you know it was funny the script is hilarious itself. The character is great. There's a feminist message to it. And then it was in my backyard. I could get to go back to Broadway and s still sleep at the farm. I'm honestly looking for a project for a while now. Yeah, there was a project, Honeymooners, uh, mm -hmm. that I was involved in and we workshopped it in New York and then we took it out of town and it didn't make it into the city because it was very hard to get a theater at that time. And, you know, we didn't have a theater owner that was willing to take a chance. But so I, it's just been about finding the right project, the right timing, because it's also difficult to go back to Broadway when you are have an album coming out or <laughs> you, uh, you are stuck in a contract on a television show. So it's just, it's a timing thing. So for this, it was the right time, the right place, the right script, the right part, and it all it all worked out. But I, I had been I had been missing it for a while, and I think part of one of the reasons why I moved back east from living in LA was that I I wanted I, I was sort of making a deliberate decision that I wanted to do another uh, Broadway show. For me, live performance, whether it is a, a musical, a play, or doing a a concert. There is nothing like it. To mm -hmm. me, there is nothing like the relationship that you start and finish with an audience. You you share a moment in time together and it's a really beautiful exchange of love that happens. And every audience is different, but somehow the same. By the same, you mean they kind of react in the same spots and they... All Friday nights are the same as other Friday nights. Tuesday nights are the same as other Tuesday <laughs> nights. Wednesday matinee. And you're like, well, it's a Wednesday matinee. We kind of know what we're going to get into. It's a Saturday matinee. Yeah, it's going to be fun. It depends on the show, but there is a similarity between the crowds that come to the shows on specific nights. But then they are unique and different on their own as well. And they are teaching you about your show. When you do your show or your concert, um, the audience reaction is informing you about your own work immediately. You are getting immediate feedback. Yep. You can feel them laughing or, or feeling devastated by something you sang. You can feel it. You can feel it. And you can also feel it when they're with you and they're not with you. If they're talking to each other in a concert, they're definitely not with you. We gotta, we gotta, we gotta maybe think about how to make this more visually interesting. 
Yeah, so what do you do when something like that happens? When you hear people talking or phones going off or does it? Well, I always make jokes about phones going off, <laughs> um, especially in like a play. You, sometimes it's not worth stopping it, yeah. but sometimes it is what, uh, <laughs> you know, or like, oh, especially 1923 when there was no cell phones. Yes. <laughs> no one talk, well, if, I would say no one talks in a Broadway. Most people don't talk to each other. I'm talking more about concerts. Yes. Uh, but however, <laughs> in this play, there's like a couple times, like, what did she say? Do you think she's gonna say yeah? I don't think she's gonna say yes. Oh my God. There's like commentary from like old little old ladies from New York. <laughs> if they're close enough to the stage and they can't hear, it's very funny. Oh, that's fabulous. It always makes me laugh because we it's so loud, we can't <laughs> not hear it. And um, but I mean, like if you're doing a concert and, and there's a lot of hubbub going on and less focus, you just go, ah, all right. I see that that's happening. There's nothing I can do about that now, but I see that that's happening. So I have to figure out how this can be more impactful or I switch this song out because I've lost them here. <laughs> and so what's the what's the rhythm of your concert when you craft your concert when you're taking it out? Mm -hmm. uh, are we do we have enough up tempos and are we dipping too much with slow songs or is our it are the things that we're saying like too deep and sad like do we need more jokes like things like this your audience tells you well actually no i think it's definitely more personal when you're doing your own music right mm -hmm. when you're doing a, a a show that someone else wrote it's not as sensitive that's right a, that's a good point but, but but it is the comedy is completely curated by the audience. And that's why we do like two or three weeks of previews before reviewers ever come, because we're getting the kinks out and we're figuring out how to make jokes land better yeah. by by utilizing the audience's response. It's yeah. an absolutely necessary part of the process. Honestly, um, I had been with the same agent for like 12 years and I switched agencies and a week later got an offer for this. <laughs> so don't stay the same agent too long. Good move. Yeah. No, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, what I hear, what I hear is, so the writer, uh, the writer actually shares my new agent with me. They had been developing this and they thought previous to COVID, they had had a theater. They were trying to attach actors to this project to come in. Uh, this was a year ago yes. to come in sometime in the next season or two. And Jason Alexander was the director. And we had met and worked on a benefit in like 2011, where I did like a medley of singing impersonations. And we remembered each other from then. Wow. He had offered me something years ago that I couldn't do. And so I ended up having this meeting with him and the writer. I read the script. I thought it was so, I was laughing on like page one. <laughs> like this is really gonna be fun to do. And uh, we had this meeting about the project and we all left it going, yeah, I think this is gonna work. And I got attached to it. And at that time we didn't have a theater. And it doesn't really, like I said, if you don't have a theater, it isn't really real. Right. Like you can be attached to a project and you're like, yay, you, you need your money and you need your theater. So I guess they had the money and then they were waiting for the theater. Gotcha. And we got a theater a lot sooner than we thought we were gonna have. In fact, I thought that I could go and do IVF and get pregnant and have a baby before this whole thing was gonna work out. I went and did IVF. It wasn't successful. I was really like down in the dumps about it. And then a, like a week later, Jason sends me a text, get your English accent ready. We've got a theater and you're going into rehearsal in May. I would have been seven months pregnant. Oh my gosh, see, everything happens for a reason. This is, you know, yeah. You, you really do have to think. And it was so funny because as I was going through IVF, I had so much like, I gotta go back to the fire right now. And like everything was like, oh, I ran into so many problems. Ugh. I was so frustrated by it. And now looking back, I go, ah. That's why. That's what was going on. And also, I wasn't really ready. Mm hmm. You know? You thought you were, but you weren't. I thought I was ready. And my family wasn't ready for child two yet. You know, I'm 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 on the fence right now. Okay. Uh, I, th you know, and this is personal. I'm, and I'm sure many other parents may have this experience. I feel as if I, there there is one more to complete my family. Okay. And but I and my son is four, and I'm 
I'm, we are in a place where we have found a groove as a family in terms of both me and my husband being able to work and be independent, us getting our time again, mm -hmm. and our son really getting quality time with us in the midst of us also being busy. And so there's something really lovely about that. And I'm like, oh. Do I want to mess with that? And also, I'm almost out of baby years here. Do I really want to go back to newborn state? Do I really want to do that again? I mean, I know the second I'd I'd have a, a child, I'd be like, yes, oh my God, I can't imagine my life. You know what I mean? So yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm giving it a second. I'm not I'm not rushing and I, I'm waiting for that like God shot, as they say, to just go, ah, there's the decision. Wow. Well, so let's make the decision for me. The universe made the decision for me last time. That's true. You want me to make it for you? I'll make it for you. Okay. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> I know everybody says that. It's the first time I've been on Broadway and not had to sing and dance. How's it feel? I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, love, I love telling stories with music. It's my favorite thing to do, whether that's like in a musical, writing a song, on a music video. I just love it. I love how I, it can work and it and touch in, in a way that other things, that, that just straight words can't. Yeah. But this has been really so lovely to try. And I'm, I just really enjoy it. And I've done so much TV and like multi-camera in the years that I've been away from Broadway, that it's a very uh, natural sort of extension. You know, it's different, but multicam simply came from plays that were just being recorded with cameras on stage. That's how it started. Okay. Basically with honeymooners. So you're going back to the original. Yeah. So I, I love, I love this, you know, keep an audience, keep an audience engaged just with words and, and storyline and intention, um, you know, for two hours. And it's nice because there's a level of maintenance when you're doing eight shows a week and you're singing and you're dancing that we don't have to have in this. Like if me and the cast want to go, next door and have a drink after the show, it's not going to kill us for the next day. That's the way to do it. Actually. Prioritizing alcohol right now. As one should. <laughs> That's what I do. That's how I revolve my life around alcohol. When can I drink next? <laughs> That's really the thing about pregnancy. I just don't want to not drink for nine months. <laughs> That's why. Okay, don't do it. Never mind. I changed my mind. I think it was bitten by the bug earlier but it wasn't necessarily like this is what i want to do okay. i just enjoyed making people react i think if i think about it because yep. i was really young like i enjoyed being a ham and getting people to laugh <laughs> or singing and surprising them or you know i i enjoyed that attention right and i enjoyed the sense of expression and play and what i say now is you know i always thought i when i was a kid i would grow up and i'd be a doctor or i'd be <laughs> something else i even went to college not for anything in the arts, I went for sociology and psychology. Yeah, so, I this was this was just in you, you know. You, you, you but, it was, but that's right, it was. So okay. I needed to go through the motions of giving myself the chance to want to do something else and have other interests. Because when you start so young, and some of it, a lot was like my mom's influence. Like, where did my mom end and I begin? And where did um, at what point did my desire for this take over? And I do think when I was 18, I I was going to college and I got a recurring role on a soap opera and I had a band that summer I had formed in the city. And it was just, ha I was just having so much fun that I ended up choosing to do those things and deferring college. And that's kind of when I knew, right? Yeah. Like, I really want to do this I really love entertainment. And I think now that I think about what the root of it is, the through line between all the different forms of entertainment that I do and really why I love to do it. And the reason that I couldn't really know until I was an adult was that I really like to play. I love to play like a kid. And when you play music and you do plays, you are playing in that state of like childlike openness and wonder and inspiration and all of that. That is what sustains me now. 
And that's why I do it. I'm never happier than when I'm in a state of play. And it doesn't matter what I'm doing. I could be doing a show or a concert or a writing a song or producing a song or whatever. I could be with with my son. But when I'm in a state of play, I'm the most joyful. That's right. Because, yeah, to me, you are you personify your personality the way you are personifies enter an entertainer that's exactly what i would think of you're who i think of when somebody says entertainment or an entertainer so i i just would think and assume you were born for this and and this is what i think i, I, think I was in fact some i did a concert last year called born to entertain about the evolution <laughs> of, which was a song i sang as a child in one of the very first song uh shows i did but i didn't know i was until right. I was an adult, right? Like I didn't know, but really all I really, I was born to play and I just happened to be use this outlet. Yeah, so I was, like I talked, like I just mentioned, God shots. That kind of thing happened to me with my desire to understand why women were not valued the way they should be in society and not supported and the, the double, double standard felt just so overwhelming to me at one point. It was like I was struck by lightning and I was like, well, this is crazy. This is wrong. <laughs> right, this is wrong. I was told I could do anything. I can't. <laughs> They've lied. <laughs> That's awesome. And I ended up doing this concert for women's rights called Double Standards, where where two Broadway stars, entertainers, comedians, recording artists came together to sing a duet on a jazz standard at the Town Hall in New York in 2017. We raised over a hundred thousand dollars for female causes, and I got that gave me the. This is not something I ever did, ever thought I would be doing. I didn't think that I didn't. Activism wasn't something that was like. A part of the mix. Yeah. But I suddenly started to realize that, wow, if we want to change minds, we must open hearts first. And the way to open hearts is through entertainment. It's through song. It's through making people laugh. We laugh at what is true. Then our heart is open. We can hear the information and the mind starts to see something new. And empathy. The arts has this opportunity to portray a character's journey and make you care about it. And so this is where we have the opportunity to tell stories about women and to talk about what we go through, but do so in an entertaining way so people listen. And so the concert was the step one. Then I did this album, Women of Tomorrow, where I delve into different issues that women are facing today through a bit more of a personal lens or a wink at you comedic lens, a poetic lens. And it was very much, you know, a form of activism, but also it was just what was on my mind. And it's like, right, they say, write what you know, or write what you're feeling, or you're inspired by. And at this time, I was inspired by this, and I still am. And then from then, you know, the, the issues that we discuss on the album, whether they be equal pay or motherhood or the the mental load of motherhood breaking the glass ceiling um a need for approval and how that extends to social media um the targeting women for marketing in terms of keeping our capitalistic society going um which is very much what american girl is about telling us that you know we can do anything and then you know, maybe we can't, but oh, whatever, over apologizing and why we apologize. So then I go deeper into those issues on our podcast, Women of Tomorrow. And, and we go deeper into things, you know, like over apologizing and why we do it and the history of it. And the, the reality is that violence against women has been one of the main reasons why we need to feel as if we can disarm. And we do so through over apologizing. What happened was what I call Dharma is where your real purpose connects with that which you're good at doing and, and want to do. And for me, um, being able to give women a voice to heal our culture when it comes to uh, the social consciousness around women's value and men's value. I have something I, I've been realizing lately having a son 
to heal us in a way through entertainment and to make change is where I really feel and to be an actor who gives a, a gives women a voice, be a songwriter that does the same. And uh, so that's a sort of, it's like an integration of those two things. Nina Simone said that uh, an artist's duty is to reflect the times. And I can go write a love song and yeah, we can connect and I'll still do that. <laughs> I can also write a song about other things that make us ponder and think, you know? And so that's kind of where I'm at right now, you know? I think American Girl is my favorite. Why? Thanks. Some of the experience of writing it with Shay Carter was just so like, oh God, like how the lyrics kind of came to us. I really like believe in, not believe, but I this sort of, cyclical pattern that we're in where women do 80% of the consuming in the world. So yeah, I'd be switching to sort of this other side of of the musical making. Um, and we're looking to sort of integrate, not just taking on women's issues, but doing so in a way with a narrative uh, where there are other characters that are representing the other belief systems in the U.S and also doing a little journey of women's history because that's also, I love women's history more than anything. I really, really do. I like to know why we are where we are. And I think that's such an important thing to understand is like, instead of to go blindly living life and accepting these things as they are, we need to understand why they exist in the first place and see if they should still exist. Do we need to continue to live this way or do we dismantle this? Um, and so I want to, in a comedic way, say, hey, this is history. So so after this play, when does this play end? The Cottage? October 29th. Okay, so what's next, aside from trying to create your album into a musical, what's next for you? What are we- Well, that really is, that I, I'm throwing my my time really into the musical after this because we're here we are at a writer strike, a SAG after strike. And that is this thing I wanna do and that allows me to do it because there isn't any other projects that I'm going into. So I will be throwing myself into that back into being a mom who can do bedtimes again <laughs> and, um, and the women of tomorrow community. And, and there's a couple of other little things that I did working on and developing, but because we're in the middle of this strike, you, we can't really do it. And on the music front, the music I'm writing is for the musical. So <laughs> That's where I'm at. It's so great to talk to you and catch up with you. It was so good to see you. Thank you so much for doing this. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye, Lisa. Bye. Thank good luck with everything.